Hey, let's get started on Middle English. It is week, uh, I want to say, I forget which week it is uh, that I'm recording this for. I think it's six. Um, yes, that's correct, six. Oh, we're starting Middle English. This is, takes us through a few hundred years of English history and a lot of changes, perhaps some of the most significant changes and biggest changes in the English language during the entire course that we're taking here. Um, so let's get started. The title of today's presentation is Middle English Contact and Borrowing or Why 45% of English is French. Um, pictured here on our title screen is the famous Bayou Tapestry, which was commissioned early during the Norman dynasty of England uh, to commemorate the Norman Conquest um, that took place in 1066. Let's run by over that really quickly, just so you're historically literate, because this is an event that had a huge effect on the linguistic and political and cultural history of England. Um, so, 1066, the, the, the last old um, Anglo-Saxon, early medieval English king, uh, Germanic from the old uh, dynasties died, 1066, his name is Edward the Confessor. He had close ties to Normandy, and had, we are told, named William the Duke of Normandy as his successor. Now, nobody's got receipts for this. It may have been a fabricated claim. That's what people did in the Middle Ages. But in any case, William, um, when Harold Godwinson, some other guys elected king instead because they didn't have hereditary kingship. They had elected kingship in, in England at this time. Um, it is immediately challenged by... Whoa, two challengers arise. Harold Hardrada of Norway, King Harold III of Norway, and William the Duke of Normandy, known in back in France as Guillaume le Bâtard, or uh, William the Bastard. Um, so, England, getting invade for, invaded from two sides in 1066. Um, at the Battle of Stamford Bridge on September 24th, Edward defeats and repels the Norwegian invasion. Uh, but then later at the Battle of Hastings, um, Normandy has about 7,000 to 8,000 men, including 1,000 to 2,000 cavalry. Harold has about the same number of, of men, but they're all foot soldiers, and they've just marched down from Stamford Bridge, which is uh, significantly to the north, north and east in England. Um, and sometime during the day, Harold takes an arrow. Eh. And uh, that's it for, for Harold uh, Godwinson. And so William the, the Bastard becomes William the Conqueror um, and proceeds to replace the upper class of England with French-speaking Normans. Um, here's a fun little game. It's a little game time segment on our lecture here. Let's play Norman or Old English. Here's a, a series of names that are or have been con uh, common in England, if not in the present, in the past. Alfred, William, Edward, Robert, Hilda, Richard, Wilfred, and Baldrick. Now, which of these names are from Old English sources? Which are from Norman? The ones in italics are Norman names. William or Guillaume, Robert or Robert, Richard, Richard, and Baldrick, which is not a very common name anymore. Maybe you're a Black Adder fan. Um, and the other ones are Old English. It's hard to tell. Now, Baldrick is an example of a name that, even though it comes from the French-speaking Normans, is actually, um, uh, what do you call it, Germanic in origin. Because the Normans themselves were a Germanic people. The name Norman is short for North Man. And so they were, other, they were also uh, invaders out of Scandinavia who kept raiding the north part of northern part of France until the king of France finally said, hey, listen, hey, listen, 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 why don't you just take that chunk and stop raiding us and you can protect us from the other Vikings and you can and you can have this whole bit of France and we'll call it Normandy after you. And the Normans were like, OK, deal. And then they started speaking French and eating cheese and like watching good, good, you know, artsy films and sort of, you know, contemplating their ennui while smoking a cigarette and staring out the window. No, I'm just kidding. Um, they mostly just, uh, you know, continued um, conquering places like England. Um, uh, 
when they came into England, they brought a lot of words with them, a lot of words with them. And a lot of the words that we have in English for um, administration, religion, military, fashion, precious stones, leisure in the arts, education, and the home all come from French, as you can see on this slide. So uh, words like court, crown, duke, empire, minister, parliament, sir, and tax, all from French. In religion, we have a baptism, cardinal, cathedral, convent, prayer, religion, and virgin to be added to the uh, vocabulary from religion that was already borrowed from Latin in Old English. And, and the, the, Fr the, the French Normans um, have uh, similar words as well, like abbot, abbe in French. Uh, in military, we get words like arms, army, battle, captain, defend, enemy, sergeant, and soldier. In fashion, we get words like boots, button, coat, collar, diamond, dress, robe, amethyst, diamond, emerald, pearl, ruby, sapphire, jewel. In the leisure, in leisure and the arts, we have art, chess, dance, literature, melody, music, paint. In education, we have anatomy, geometry, grammar, medicine, noun, grammar, yay, square, geometry, huh? And in the home, we have words like blanket, ceiling, cellar, curtain, cushion, and towel. Now, Given that all our words for these for so many things like this come from French, it might give us the mistaken impression that the old English uh, people had a much lower level of um, uh, political and cultural organization and sophistication. This is not the case. It's simply that all of the upper class that spoke old English were entirely dis dispossessed, exiled, kicked out, and replaced by a French-speaking upper class. And so... The words for upper class fancy type things remained French up to the present day in many respects. Um, we also end up with, since we get so many words borrowed from French, a number of what are called doublets. And a doublet is when we have two words for the same thing. Um, in English, we have many doublets that uh, where we have a word from romance and a word from Germanic that means the same thing. And we talked a little bit about this already um, in a previous lecture uh, about the, the Latin legacy um, in English versus the Germanic legacy. But um, this really intensifies over the, the, uh, the Middle English centuries as uh, England is, while it's still 90% of the people in England still speak English, it's ruled by a 10% French speaking uh, nobility. Uh, and and many, many of the members, upper members of the church are French speaking as well. Uh, so. In Rome, so I'm going to give you a list here of words that are Romance and with their Germanic counterpart is English doublets. Um, we have aid and assist um, in, from French and help from Germanic. Um, the word mayday, by the way, mayday, mayday is actually French for help me. May, M apostrophe A I D E Z. Mayday, help me. Aid, assist, help. Commence versus begin or start. The French conceal versus the Germanic hide. The Romance cordial versus a Germanic hardy. And again, this really speaks to the kind of difference in tone and um, experience and association that we as English speakers uh, bring to this different uh, set of vocabulary. A cordial welcome is not the same thing as a hearty welcome, right? Um, and uh, yeah, and one, one can eat a hearty soup, but not a cordial soup. Anyway, um, desire versus wish. It was the French versus the German, uh, the, the fraternal versus the brotherly, the infant versus the child, liberty versus freedom. That's an interesting one. And I think the semantic distinctions between those two are still um, at work in our current political uh, linguistic culture. And marriage versus wedding. It's an interesting one. So, yeah. Um, I'm going to talk more in the next video. Um, I'm going to go into detail more about uh, the history of England in the in the subsequent centuries and the the relative um, rising prestige and falling prestige of the three languages of um, medieval England, which were French, Latin, and English. Uh, English really takes a hit in 1066 and really kind of um, in the words of uh, Mervyn Peak, uh, sorry, Mer Melvin Bragg, goes underground for a while. But not really. It's just that the rich, powerful people who have access to writing aren't speaking English. But English survives, as we will, 
as well. I'm talking it right now, so obviously it survives. Thank you for joining me. Uh, meet me in the next.